Banjo-Kazooie, one of the most famous Nintendo 64 games of all time. To some, this was just a solid game, and to others, it's the peak of 3D platforming with few games matching it. This game is so popular that merch still comes out to this day. Every year, people clamor for a new entry in the series, and of course, who could forget their addition to Super Smash Bros. Ultimate? But did you know this game featuring a bear and a bird didn't actually start that way? It wasn't even in the same genre. It originally started as a role-playing game titled Dream Land of the Giants, and up until a few years ago, only a handful of images and basic information was even known about the game. Since then, we've learned more and more, and we can see the evolution from this game to this game. This is the previously unknown origin of Banjo-Kazooie. In 1982, Chris and Tim Stamper started Ashby Computers and Graphics, a video game development company. Realizing that the popularity of arcade cabinets was on the way out, the two brothers began developing for the ZX Spectrum, an 8-bit personal computer that was the most popular in the UK where they were based. They would publish these video games under the label of Ultimate Play the Game, and eventually published titles to many other personal computers during the early to mid-80s. These games found a range of success, but by far their most popular were the Jetpack and Saberwolf series. Even back then, Rare was utilizing new technologies that no one else was taking advantage of, helping them stand out from the crowd. When the Famicom released in Japan in 1983, the developers at Ultimate managed to get their hands on an imported console. Impressed with the console and its technological and accessibility advantages over home computers, the company felt they wanted to create games for this platform. A new division was opened at Ultimate Play the Game specifically for Famicom development. Rare Designs on the Future For eight months, this division analyzed every aspect of the Famicom. They studied its hardware and software, did their own experiments with the console, and then eventually created demos using that information. The Stamper brothers were so confident in the future of home console gaming that they actually sold off Ultimate Play the Game in 1985 to US Gold, a British game publisher. Fortunately for them, this sale didn't include Rare and any of the information that that division had, so they were free to focus on the Famicom, or as it would come to be known internationally, the Nintendo Entertainment System. The ironic part about all this hard work is that Nintendo claimed that the Famicom was impossible to reverse engineer. They were soon disabused of that notion when Rare presented to them in Kyoto, showing off multiple tech demos proving that they not only did the impossible, but went further beyond. This resulted in the green light for Rare to be given an unlimited budget from Nintendo, put towards Famicom game development, which was an impressive feat considering how selective Nintendo was in regards to developers. This budget allowed them to accelerate their game development, working with many companies on licensed titles, but also titles of their own creation, with perhaps the most famous game to come out of this era being Battletoads. Stay Pickford, a Rare employee, stated that during this time, Rare wanted to make as many games as they could in their window of opportunity, and clearly that's exactly what they did. No genre, no concept, no game was off limits, which resulted in Rare creating nearly 50 games for the NES in just six years. But the market was once again about to change, and Rare was going to change with it. The Super Nintendo Entertainment System had been revealed, and rather than take their insane game development steam into this new Super era, they decided to go a different route. Using their profits from the NES era, Rare purchased Silicon Graphics workstations in order to create 3D models. This could have been seen as a potentially devastating decision, as the Super Nintendo was not capable of 3D technology on its own, but Rare already knew that. Rare instead used the Silicon Graphics systems to create complex 3D models. These models would then be rendered out into predetermined poses and actions and converted into sprites that the Super Nintendo could handle. This process, combined with the Super Nintendo's improved hardware and colors, resulted in some stunning sprites that few other game developers could match. Using this technique, Rare created a demo for a boxing game that they titled Brute Force. They presented this demo to Nintendo, who were incredibly impressed with their results. This would lead Nintendo to purchase a 25% stake into Rare, which would gradually turn into a 49% share, officially making Rare a second-party developer for Nintendo. There is some conflicting information on what happened next. 
According to Steve Mails, an artist, and Chris Sutherland, a programmer, Nintendo gave Rare free reign to make a game using any of the Nintendo properties. On the other hand, Greg Mails, a Rare designer, says that Nintendo requested a specific property. But whichever recollection is true, the outcome remains the same. Rare, which had then changed its name to Rareware, had the Donkey Kong property in their hands, and they were free to do with it as they wished. And that is how we got the epic adventure of Donkey Kong Country, the game that redefined the Donkey Kong series forever. That game performed so well that Nintendo ordered a sequel, Donkey Kong Country 2, Diddy's Conquest. And then eventually a third entry was ordered in the series. But Rare shook things up a bit internally for this third entry. While their core teams worked on both Donkey Kong Country 1 and 2, the third entry, the designers were split up. One team would go on to create Donkey Kong Country 3, Dixie Kong's Double Trouble, and another team would focus on a brand new project, setting out to make their dreams come true. With two critically and commercially successful platformers under their belt, the core team at Rare wanted to take their unique graphics and development style and create a non-platformer game. They eventually decided that this new game would be a role-playing game. Everyone working on the project loved this style of adventure game, with Japanese role-playing games and the LucasArts point-and-click adventures being their primary inspirations. The game was going to take place in a sort of fairy tale mystical world, filled with trolls and magic and pirates. So the game was codenamed Project Dream, chosen to represent their aspirations for the game and also fit the theme of the project. Eventually, this codename would evolve into the actual title for the game, becoming Dream Land of the Giants. Dream stars a young boy named Edson, alongside his girlfriend Madeline, and a dog he finds at the beginning of the game, Dinger. The group finds themselves in some sort of predicament with a band of pirates. Led by Captain Black Eye, the pirates were after a magical material known as Floaty, which would allow their pirate ship to fly. Using this flying ship, the pirates could more easily conquer the land because they weren't limited exclusively to sea travel. The player primarily controls Edson, who would be the main source of combat for the game. Dinger, meanwhile, could perform different actions, like running ahead of Edson or digging into the ground to find an item. Design-wise, Edson was made to be a bit more limited, with all of the player's abilities that they would need instead falling onto Dinger's skinny shoulders. Towards the end of this version of the game's development, only a handful of concepts actually made it onto the game and into the public eye. We've seen Edson and Dinger exploring and fighting against the troll. According to Ed Bryan, an artist for Project Dream, the final concept actually executed in the game was the idea of a giant dinosaur leg that could crush Edson. The screen would sort of shake and rumble, warning the player that the dinosaur was nearby and giving them the opportunity to get to safety. But unfortunately, soon after this, Dream on the Super Nintendo would meet its end. For what it's worth, the game really looks fantastic, and I think the team's goal of surpassing the graphics of Donkey Kong Country was easily satisfied and then some. It just really looks phenomenal. Unfortunately, with the Nintendo 64 on the horizon, it was decided that the focus of Project Dream should move on to that new console. The pre-rendered sprites that Rare specialized in really only succeeded for the Super Nintendo. As Steve Mails put it, the introduction of the Nintendo 64 made pre-rendered graphics obsolete, so they switched development over to the new machine after only a few months. On top of that, the aspirations Rare had for the game made it too big for the SNES. With these two factors in mind, they jumped ship over to the N64. Much of the work porting the game over proved to be fairly easy, with a lot of the SNES supporting code easily copied over to the N64 game. It was during this rework that the fairy tale elements started to be phased out. Many of the developers were worried that the game would appear too childish if they kept them in, and so they instead focused on the pirate theme and began building their world and story around that idea instead. And as the world of Dream evolved around Edson, suddenly the little guy just kind of looked out of place. He was the final remnant from the old fantasy game stuck in this pirate-themed game, so he just kind of looked off. And so, it was time for a new protagonist to be drawn up. Initially, they sketched out a bunny, which ended up being scrapped pretty quickly. And then they went with a bear, which everyone seemed to love. They made sure from the jump to give this bear humanoid qualities. He walked on two legs, and he had a backpack to carry his items in. It's hard to tell when this bear was christened Banjo, but for all intents and purposes, he was basically Banjo from his initial sketch. Dream would continue its development for about another year before the team came to an inevitable conclusion. The game was just too big. 
They had too many ambitions, too many ideas, that they realized that the game would take multiple years from that point to actually finish, at the risk of the hardware even allowing it in the first place. But they really liked Banjo as a character, so they thought, can we take this bear and come up with another game that we can build in a reasonable time frame? And with that final nail in the coffin, Project Dream was retired. The epic adventure that Rare had dreamed up and worked on over the previous year and some change was shelved, with just that bear with a backpack remaining. The next iteration of the project looked rather different than even Dream for N64 looked. It used much of the same framework and graphics, but it implemented a different style of gameplay. Many Rare developers have referred to this as a sort of evolution of the Donkey Kong Country gameplay, just in a 3D environment. Levels were very much start-to-finish affairs, with the added bonus of Banjo being able to walk towards and away from the screen in addition to left and right. This version of the game was to be called Kazoo, following along with the musical theme of Banjo's name. Many of the game's design documents have been made available online, showing off many of the ideas that the developers had. We can see many of the baddies that were planned for the game, some of which inevitably ended up in the final game. They had a concept called Bubble Speak, which would replace straight-up dialogue by simply providing thought bubbles with images inside. The game also had Fruit Houses, based on the idea of collecting fruit through Banjo's journey. Banjo's primary tool would be different balls. Each of the different balls in the game would have different properties and uses, with upgrades and variations available later on. To match this theme, Banjo was given a sort of skater vibe, with his jump in particular looking similar to a skateboard trick. Even the initial idea for the health system went with this theme, with Banjo losing or gaining clothing as he takes damage or heals up. We can also get a glimpse of some of the level designs planned for Kazoo, and most notably we can see the very linear nature of these levels. There are branching paths, but there's a clearly defined start and a clearly defined end, and you don't particularly have full freedom to go where you want, you really have to stick to one of the paths. It's actually quite interesting to see these early concepts. You can see plenty of early ideas that would make it all the way to the final Banjo-Kazooie. Jinjos were prominent throughout the levels, jigsaw pieces were still the primary collectible, and even the general aesthetic matches up with some of the early worlds in the final game. Kazoo is also the iteration of the game that finally brought us Banjo's bird companion, but she wasn't named Kazooie then. Instead, she was named Tweeter. Tweeter's creation is actually really wild because the idea spawned purely out of a need for Banjo to double jump. Rare wanted him to be able to do this, but they weren't exactly satisfied with Banjo inexplicably gaining more air for no reason. Since Banjo still had his backpack from the Project Dream days, they thought, what if a pair of wings popped out of the backpack and that's where his double jump comes from? Later down the line, they wanted to give Banjo the ability to run quickly. Again, they looked at the backpack, and they came up with a pair of legs popping out in order to run for Banjo. With these two concepts, it just became a natural progression for them to create a whole character that lived inside the backpack, rather than simply wings and legs coming out for no reason. And thus, Tweeter the Bird was born. This eventually opened up a whole new world of possibilities for the duo's moveset. Banjo would handle the ground-based moves, while Tweeter would handle everything in the air. So many of these ideas will be familiar to people with the final game. Outside of the double jump and dash, Tweeter would enable Banjo to fly, served as the ground pound, and he would even peck Banjo for his idle animation. The concept of eggs as weapons seemed to come at a later point, because you are reading that right, instead of eggs, Tweeter would sh**. Yep, there's a universe where their neutral special in Smash isn't an egg, but a hack of bird poop. And I wish I lived in that world. As a game, Kazoo did make some decent progress, but the biggest roadblock was Rare's continued use of the Project Dream workspace. Everything up to this point was still building off of what the team had made for Dream, and outside of being a somewhat limiting environment, the visual style was too taxing for the N64 to handle well, and the game never really seemed to maintain a steady frame rate on the actual hardware. And so, for the fourth time, the game would see a new iteration. Aside from the hardware issues that they were experiencing with Kazoo, there were two video games that they saw that inspired them to fully rework their game. Their biggest inspiration was Super Mario 64, Nintendo's flagship 3D platformer that launched alongside the N64. But on top of that, another team at Rare was also working on a 3D platformer game for the N64, 12 Tales Conquer 64, the sequel to Conquer's Pocket Tales for the Game Boy. 
In comparison to both Mario 64 and Conker, Kazoo looked incredibly primitive, and had they released the game in its current state, the game would probably have been a tremendous flop. So using the technological success of these two games as inspirations, back to the drawing board they went. But this time was different. With this inspiration in their minds, suddenly the game's development really started moving. Finally, they had a clear focus and a goal for the team to shoot for, which really they hadn't had since the game had been back on the SNES. Within a week after completely scrapping essentially everything that they had, they had Banjo and his bird friend running around in a truly 3D environment. One world, commonly referred to as Temple Test Area by the devs, and then another world that would ultimately end up as the game's first world, Mumbo's Mountain. At some point during this early development, the game's name changed from just Kazoo to Banjo Kazoo. But apparently there were copyright concerns with this version of the name, so they just slapped on the E at the end, and bam, we got Banjo Kazooie. Tweeter's name was also changed to B Kazooie, since ultimately this game had become about the duo's adventure. A ton of the game's charm is the witty, dry, and sarcastic humor that comes out of the interactions with the characters. Banjo is kind of dim-witted, but he's often eager to help anyone that they come across, while Kazooie is essentially a smartass, making fun of everyone and demanding rewards and abilities straight away. And none of this really ended up being scripted or planned. The general personalities were certainly established, but really much of the writing was made up on the spot when it was necessary, with the writers just kind of coming up with things as needed that they found funny. Initially this dialogue was all going to be voice acted, but that idea was scrapped pretty quickly after its inception. Not only would it severely increase development time, but it would require more space on the cartridge that the team wasn't sure that they could afford at the time. Instead, many different sentences or noises were created for each of the characters. Then, these were chopped up into various individual sound bites, and then played at random in the final game. This allowed for each character to have their own unique voice in a way that sounded natural without using loads and loads of data. Looking at the final game, there really isn't a ton from the original Project Dream that made its way into Banjo-Kazooie. The only exception seems to be a ghost enemy named Teehee. The heads of the Teehee originally came from the trolls from the N64 version of Dream. The designers just popped their head off, gave it a more ghostly aura, a ghost body to match, and bam, we have the Teehee enemy. And so, after three years of development, through four different iterations on two different consoles, Banjo-Kazooie finally released on June 29th, 1998. And the game... do I even need to say it? It's really good. Banjo-Kazooie opens with Gruntilda the Witch asking her cauldron who the prettiest in the land is, and the cauldron responds that Tootie is. Furious, Gruntilda swears to steal her beauty, and she kidnaps Tootie while her brother Banjo is asleep. Banjo finds Tootie missing, and enters Grunty's lair determined to make his way to the top alongside Kazooie and rescue Tootie from the evil witch. Along the way, Banjo and Kazooie both gain new abilities from Bottles the Molt. Bottles teaches you tons of abilities, from physical attacks to shooting out eggs, learning to fly, or even using different shoes that give you special powers. And they work with Mumbo Jumbo, a shaman who can transform Banjo into a bunch of different creatures in exchange for Mumbo tokens. There are a ton of different collectibles in the different worlds. Of course, there are Jiggies, which are the main collectible of the game. Jiggies that you've collected get placed into murals throughout Grunty's Lair, the game's main hub, in order to open up access to new worlds. There are also music notes, which allow you to open magically sealed doors in Grunty's lair. Creatures called Jinjos have been trapped inside each world, and collecting all five results in a Jiggy. And then you can find extra honeycombs, which help to increase Banjo's maximum health. Each world also has a host of characters that the Baron Bird help, or sometimes absolutely terrorize. Usually doing so results in a Jiggy, or it will activate a new event that then results in a Jiggy. And man, I just have to say it again, the game is really good. To me, this is just peak 3D platformer. The worlds are all cleverly built so that they feel like actual locations rather than just a level to conquer. Around every corner is something to find. A new friend, a new enemy, a polar bear with a stomach ache, a camel that has to share its water with that tree right now. But even just purely from a gameplay standpoint, the game never really feels like it gives you a dull moment. And this is partly because of the collectibles that are found all over. I think Banjo-Kazooie has like the perfect amount of things to find in a game. It's just found that sweet spot. 
any less, and I feel like the game would be too boring and empty. But any more, like some other rare game, and I feel like I would just simply be way too overwhelmed. But I think an equally important part to me personally is that the game doesn't boot you out to the main hub of the game when you collect a Jiggy. In Mario 64, once you collect a star, you're sent back to Peach's castle, and you have to enter in again to claim another. This really slows down the gameplay, and you're forced to go to the same starting point each time, making your way to a new star based on a new mission. Now I get why they did that, the mission names really help give a hint, but I feel like that's at the cost of making each world just feel like a level and not a lived-in world, and that really sets the worlds in Banjo apart. And on top of that, things you do in a world can impact the other parts of the world. This concept is probably best executed in the game's final world, Click Clock Wood. The world has four variations, each representing a different season, and things you do in one season carry over into the next. For example, you lay some eggs in a hole and it, somehow, plants a sprout. That sprout gets watered and as you go through the seasons, you see it grow until it blooms into a flower and gives you a jiggy. I think I'd be roasted forever if I didn't mention the fantastic music in this game composed by the very talented Grant Kirkhope. This dude is a video game soundtrack legend, and Banjo-Kazooie delivers for every single song. But I think my favorite part of the music is that as you travel through different areas inside a location, the song playing will fully shift over to a different version of the song playing completely seamlessly. This was Grant's main vision for the game, and you can find this happening all over the place. The first place you'll notice this is in Grunty's Lair, because this area has so many subsections. But this cool musical transition happens legitimately all over the game. Every world has multiple renditions of the same song. Grunty's Lair is just the most obvious, going from different instruments used to different genres to a whole different time signature. I also absolutely love the twist at the end, if you can call it that. You open the final note door thinking you're going to be entering this epic final boss fight just to get greeted with… a game show. Now you're going to be put to the test to see how well you are paying attention throughout the game, with trivia on enemy names, voices, songs, and challenges. You're also really going to struggle if you didn't talk to Grunty's sister Brentilda to learn trivia about her. And then after all that you're going to get your epic final boss fight, but they really do trick you for a second. After the game show, credits even roll to make you think, oh, that's the end of the game. There was actually a sort of post-game plan for after you defeat Grunty. In the final game, she fires a spell that misses Banjo and Kazooie, but in the original concept, the spell would actually hit them and turn them into frogs. Then, the player would take control of Tootie, who would go back through all the worlds Banjo went through and collect some sort of coin to reverse the spell. Ultimately though, this ended up being scrapped, but I think that's alright, I think the ending we got ended up being pretty great anyway. But Banjo-Kazooie isn't perfect, because no game is, and there are a couple of pretty obvious flaws. Sometimes it's really hard to tell where your jump is going to land, even though you have a shadow beneath you. Swimming also feels pretty stiff when you need to maneuver through specific small spaces, but these are pretty few and far between. The use of music notes in all of these worlds is also a little archaic, and I think it's just a sign of the game's age. You collect 100 in every world, but if you happen to die, every single note you collected gets restored in that world, and you get a best note score. This best note score is what gets used to open up new doors, so if you happen to die, you have to collect every single note again. It's kind of a pain, especially in the later worlds like Rusty Bucket Bay, because it can already be difficult to get every note because they're so scattered. It also has issues that are just a product of the era. The camera in general is just kind of crappy, and the frame rate can really dip down at some points. Developers were universally trying to figure out the best way to execute 3D gameplay. It was a brand new medium for games, and they all had their own different ways to accomplish the same goal. The N64 was also just not really that crazy powerful, so the game having frame rate issues, particularly when a lot is happening on the screen, it isn't exclusively the game's fault. A decent amount of blame can also be placed on the console as well. But fortunately, these last few issues were fully addressed in 2008. Rare had been purchased by Microsoft in 2002, and multiple properties were being reused in the years following. On November 26, 2008, Banjo-Kazooie was released as an Xbox Live arcade title, but this wasn't simply dumping the N64 game onto Xboxes. I would call this a comfortable middle ground between a re-release and a remaster. 
the games were all upgraded to play in widescreen with HD graphics, naturally with all of the user interface now matching Xbox's control schemes. And addressing the issues of the N64 version, the better hardware allowed for the frame rate to become much more stable, and the near decade of experience allowed for them to implement a fully controllable camera. The issue with music notes is also a thing of the past, with these now being permanently collected even if you die. But the biggest addition to this new version of the game is the ultimate realization of the elusive feature Stop and Swap. During Banjo-Kazooie's development, the team at Rare figured out a strange quirk with the Nintendo 64 hardware. If a game is removed while the console is still on, the memory for the system still contains information from the removed game. This went even further, as the team realized that you could then insert a new game and then transfer the information from the memory over to the new game. From this, the feature that was dubbed Stop and Swap was born, which would have asked the player to stop playing, remove their Banjo-Kazooie cart, and then insert a new cart quickly. Yeah, this just feels illegal. The main goal for the feature was that during the course of Banjo-Kazooie, the player would discover six mystery eggs and an ice key. These could then be transferred over to Banjo-Tooie using Stop and Swap, and presumably some reward would be given to the player. Unfortunately, this resulted in a number of concerns, primarily from Nintendo. Chris Sutherland, one of the software engineers on Banjo-Kazooie, revealed that they hadn't really shown Nintendo this feature until towards the end of development, mostly because they didn't really think they had to. But when Nintendo saw this, they recommended that this not make it into the final release. They were concerned that players would damage either the game or their system using this feature, and that the feature wouldn't be guaranteed to work on every individual Nintendo 64. On top of this, revisions in the N64's hardware made this feature functionally impossible. On older versions of the console, the player would have about 10 seconds to swap one cart over to another without issue. Newer versions, however, would have reduced this time to just one second, which I suppose could be done, but it would result in a far higher rate of failure than on older hardware. Ultimately, the idea was scrapped from the final release, but a single reference to the original plan actually existed in Banjo-Kazooie. When the player successfully collects all 100 Jiggies, Mumbo rewards them with three photographs, two showing mystery eggs and the third, the ice key, and hinting that these will be important for the sequel. You can actually input certain cheat codes into the sandcastle in Treasure Trove Cove to make the eggs and ice key appear, but all that collecting them does is give you an additional menu showing that you have them collected. For years, the mystery behind these eggs and key, the mysterious stop and swap mode, and how that interacted with Banjo-Tooie plagued Banjo fans. To this day, we still get a slow trickle of information about this feature. In 2018, a rare software engineer revealed that it wasn't just the Banjo games that would utilize this feature, with Blast Core, Conker's Bad Fur Day, and Donkey Kong 64 all planned to be compatible as well. In 2020, he revealed even more, saying that each egg was originally meant to correspond to a different rare game, and if you could transfer the ice key throughout all of the games and bring it back to Banjo-Kazooie, some kind of super code would be unlocked as the ultimate reward. But as I said, this feature ended up finding its way into the Xbox Live Arcade re-release all these years later. This time, all of the eggs and the key can be found during normal gameplay. No need to input a code. However, this version of the system now links to Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolts, rewarding the player with rare vehicle parts in the new game after obtaining these items. It's certainly not the reward Rare originally intended, and it would be really cool to find out what that was, but it's nice to see such a big gaming mystery have some kind of resolution after all these years. In 2015, Banjo-Kazooie was once again re-released as part of Rare Replay, a collection of 30 games created by Rare to celebrate its 30th anniversary. This version of the game was the enhanced Xbox Live Arcade version simply ported over to the Xbox One. But this collection also came with brand new interviews with current and former Rare employees, and in fact this video would be much, much shorter if that hadn't happened. Prior to Rare Replay's release, we knew so little about Project Dream, we only had like a handful of screenshots and barely a premise of the game. But Rare Replay blew that wide open, showing us brand new footage and concepts, and the mystery of Project Dream had finally been solved. 
Most recently, Nintendo released Banjo-Kazooie as a part of their Nintendo Switch Online expansion pack service, allowing you to emulate a library of N64 games right on your Switch. This is of course not the enhanced version on the Xbox, it's just the N64 game, but running on the Switch does really help with some framerate issues you'd experience. Personally, I still think the Xbox version is now my favorite way to play the game, but if you only have access to a Switch, this version is perfectly fine and I still highly recommend you play this game. And that is the story of Banjo-Kazooie, the result of a series of decisions that created, personally, one of my favorite games of all time. It's amazing to look back at what the game was, look at its evolution, and realize how fortunate we are to have gotten the game that we did. Many people feel that this was the best possible outcome, because while Dream was probably going to be a decent game, it probably would not have had the success that Banjo-Kazooie had. In fact, few 3D platformers in the years since have lived up to that expectation. Rare would go on to create a sequel, Banjo-Tooie, which many consider good, but not as good as the original. In early 2015, it was announced that developers who had left Rare would come together to form a new game studio and create a true spiritual successor to Banjo-Kazooie and Tui, to be crowdfunded via Kickstarter. This game would release as Yooka Laylee, and my thoughts on the game would be too much to speak on right now, so we're gonna save that for a future video. But that is going to do it for this video, and I want to thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed, you know what to do. Hit that like button and be sure to subscribe. I will see you guys next time, peace out, and please remember to be good to one another.